A Karen in a Walmart thinks that I work there and screams at me for poor customer service, but I'm 12 and I don't work here, lady. She doesn't want to understand that, so here's what happened. Subscribe to Am I the Jerk on YouTube and hit the bell to turn on notifications. When this story happened, I was 12. Basically, I was a tiny child, always have been. Back then, I looked like I was 11 or so. I'm not sure why this woman thought that I worked at Walmart, but I think she needs to get her eyes checked because in no way, shape, or form did I look like I was old enough to begin working. To this day, I still don't understand what made me look like I was working at Walmart. But maybe telling this story will make other people understand where she is coming from because I don't. Here's the situation. I was at Walmart alone because I was buying my dad a birthday present and he had driven me there. In fact, he was waiting outside. My parents had always made sure that I learned to keep myself safe and so far I had done a great job at that. So I'm in the car aisle and I see a whole mess of cards that are very out of order, if that makes any sense. Me being the perfectionist that I am, I decide to rearrange them so they at least look like they're in order. But unfortunately, I hear that sound that we all know. <laughs> At first, I didn't think anybody was talking to me because why would anyone be talking to me? But once I turn around, I see a woman that looks fairly short with the classic Karen haircut staring straight at me. At first, I think that I'm just in her way and I simply just apologize and move out of the way. I'm sorry, ma'am. And I continue to search for a good card for my father's birthday. Then she scoffs at me as if I just offended her family. Well, aren't you going to help me? Pardon? Obviously, I don't know where I am, so just show me where the baby diapers are now. Now. Now, I know exactly where everything is in this Walmart, but I don't want to walk around the store with a woman I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't work here, therefore I can't help you. Ugh, you Walmart workers are all the same, aren't you? I want to speak to your manager! At this point, I'm confused as to why she isn't getting the message, and like I said before, I look way too young to be working here. Ma'am, I don't work here. Please leave me alone. I'm getting uncomfortable. As I turn to leave, she grabs me, spins me around, crouches down, and yells at me for not showing her where the diapers are. Don't you dare walk away from a paying customer. At this point, I am literally shaking and on the verge of tears because I've never been harassed by an adult before. An employee hears the screaming and runs over to see this woman practically holding me hostage while screaming at me. The employee removes her hands from me and asks me if I know her. No, I'm just here to get a present for my dad. Okay, I'm gonna call the cops if you don't leave right now. He said, turning his attention to the woman. <laughs> I just don't understand why she won't direct me to the diapers. Ma'am, this girl's about 11 years old, and she doesn't even look like she's an employee here. She's not even wearing the uniform. The woman abruptly walks out of the store. No more words are exchanged out of her. I thank the employee, grab a card I was looking at before she interrupted, paid, and walked out of the store praying she still wasn't out there. I told my dad what happened, and he was furious. Neither one of us can understand how she thought I worked there. I never saw her again, and I hope it stays that way. What should I have done? The concept of the story started off sounding pretty funny because it was so absurd that somebody would mistake a kid who's not even in uniform as being an employee of Walmart just because they were organizing the cards. But then it kind of took a more serious turn than I expected. The Karen in the situation actually seemed more unhinged than I originally expected and was basically screaming at her in her face, grabbing her, which is taking it over the line. That's beyond a simple misunderstanding. And something's got to be seriously wrong if you think it's okay or normal to do this to a person person in general, let alone a 12 year old, to grab them because you think they're not giving you sufficient customer service. Hopefully one day they do find her so this doesn't happen to more people in the future. But let me know how you would have handled the situation down below. This is a military revenge story. A soldier wants out of the army. The commander agrees pending good behavior. The soldier messes around and ends up in the brig before getting kicked out. Back in my army days, I was once in command of a unit of about 80 soldiers in Hawaii. Most of the soldiers in my command were great people, happy to do their jobs and take home a paycheck. Hard workers, creative, adaptable to unusual army conditions, and generally reliable. But there was one who was trouble from the start. Gentle reader meets Private Wiggles. My first awareness of Wiggles came two or three days after I'd taken command of the unit. We're prepping for a month-long training exercise to Thailand, and Platoon Sergeant Maggie tells me Wiggles might not be able to go, as she just had an outpatient medical procedure. Departure is about a week away, and I have to validate the personnel roster to make sure we We've got logistical support for everyone we're bringing. Transportation, food, 
food, lodging, etc. So I talk directly with Wiggles and ask if she's okay to travel and participate in the exercise. Wiggles says it's not a problem, she can handle it. We get to Thailand and set up camp on a Thai army base. Two days in and the medical section sends a runner to find me. Wiggles is at our medical clinic, tents with cots and surprisingly extensive medical supplies, laid out with extreme abdominal pain. I cruise over to the clinic tent and the physician's assistant, PA, on duty, tells me a couple of things. Wiggles acknowledged recently having an abortion. The previously mentioned outpatient medical procedure and the PA's examination, physician's assistant, and testing shows that Wiggles has the single worst case of pelvic inflammatory disease, PID, he's ever seen. Seriously, this army PA who has seen all sorts of crazy stuff from soldiers was emphatically impressed by how bad it was. Wiggles developed PID from failing to get treatment for STI infections for a long, long time. As in, she's almost glowing from it. No judgment on the abortion. Not everyone is ready for kids. And the STI-induced PID can be treated with high-dose antibiotics, which the PA has on hand. Not a problem. We've got this covered. Wiggles is released to Sergeant Deb, her section sergeant, who will make sure Wiggles takes her antibiotics and keep an eye on her for any further issues. Sergeant Deb finds me and First Sergeant Bob about a day later and tells me two more things about Wiggles. She's refusing to take her antibiotics and she wants to get out of the army. I again talk with Wiggles. So you want out of the army? You know you have a couple of years left on your contract, right? I know, but I'm just done being a soldier and I want to be out of the army. Okay, I can make that happen. You don't want to be here, then I don't want you to be here either. But here's the deal. You got to play by the rules. I can get you out with an honorable discharge and I'll start the paperwork as soon as we're back in Hawaii. But you need to take your antibiotics, do your job, and be where you're supposed to be. You do your part and I'll do my part for you. Sound good? Wiggle says, yep, I can do that. Spoiler alert, she couldn't do that. For the rest of the Thailand exercise, Sergeant Deb had to take control of Wiggle's meds and force her to take them. When she actually found Wiggles, who consistently found some place else to be. At one point in the next week or so, she accused First Sergeant Bob of doing the deed with her, easily disproven as he doesn't have any STIs and Wiggles has all of them. She was just trying to stir up trouble with wild accusations, I guess. We get back to Hawaii and I start the process to get her out of the army because as much as she's been a handful of trouble in Thailand, I'm thinking it's still easier at this point to kick her to the curb than it is to keep her around and punish her before kicking her out. I was wrong. Even as I start to work on her discharge, she ramps up the stupidity. Here are a few examples. Wiggles gets caught drinking at only 19. Wiggles and her husband lie to the on-base housing office and provide forged authorization documents to get into rent-free on-base housing that they didn't qualify for. Side note, Mr. Wiggles was no winner either. He was about to be dishonorably charged from his infantry unit for selling drugs to the other soldiers. Wiggles shows up at the infirmary to get medical treatment for facial bruising. Mr. Wiggles used his combat boots to kick her when Wiggles accused him of cheating on her. Wiggles refuses to show up for work or any unit formation and can't be found anywhere for days. Wiggles slashes all four tires on Mr. Wiggles' car, then attacks him with the knife when he confronts her. The military police are called, end up taking him in when Wiggles gives a sob story. But he's the one with the defensive wounds on his hands, not her. One of my male sergeants uses my open door policy to visit me one day, tells me he saw Wiggles stripping at one of the skank gear gentlemen's clubs down in Honolulu the night before. And she had also convinced one of our other female soldiers to come along with her to do the same. Here's a weird one. I get a call from a temp agency asking me if it's okay for Wiggles to continue working through them as an administrative assistant for clients in town. Not uncommon for soldiers to have a second job, but with everything else that she was up to at the time, this one just had me going, what the heck? There's more, but you get the idea. At this point, Wiggle's actions are egregious enough that I can no longer just kick her out with an honorable discharge. I put her on notice that she's at risk for a court martial. I thought that threat might keep her in line, but she just couldn't seem to stop herself from getting stupider and stupider. It's the old 80-20 problem. 80% of your time is spent dealing with 20% of your folks who are troublemakers. At this point, I'm wasting a not insignificant amount of time dealing with Wiggle's issues almost daily. I had genuinely and in good faith offered her the easy path, but I guess she figured she'd try to burn the place down on the way out since she apparently thought that she was getting what she wanted no matter what she did. I was reminded of what my old platoon sergeant used to say when I was coming up through the ranks. You want to get stupid? Go ahead. But I can get stupider. Cue the revenge. She's causing me daily headaches, so I'm going to bring the pain back to her. Honorable discharge paperwork is out the window, and I lean into the special court martial process instead. My legal counsel tells me that Wiggle's activities are likely to get 
her a couple weeks confinement at most. Maybe not even that. She may get a monetary fine, but she'll probably get an OTH other than honorable discharge. Potential for a bad conduct discharge, which are worse. While her actions have not been that good, they are also not that bad. I'm rational enough to understand that. I have a brief chat with Captain Morgan, Wiggles' military defense attorney, about where I'm going with this case. During our chat, I tried to be a gentleman and let him know that Wiggles is going to be trouble for him if he's not careful. He gives me a condescending, this ain't my first rodeo, baka. I'm a big boy and I can take care of myself. Fair enough. I tried to warn you. Normally, a soldier getting a special court martial for piddly squat might get confined to the barracks, restricted to their on-base quarters, or something similar for the duration of the process. It's not like she killed someone, right? However, my military legal counsel drops this little gem in my ear. He tells me that Wiggles has met all five of the conditions, danger to others, flight risk, etc., required by military law, Uniform Code of Military Justice, UCMJ, to warrant requesting confinement prior to her trial. He tells me, if you can remember these five conditions and elaborate on the details at our next pre-trial meeting with the military magistrate, you might be able to get her confined to the Navy brig at Ford Island until the trial. I'm a guy who likes to pay attention to sound legal advice, so I do just as he says. A couple days later, we go in for the pre-trial meeting and I run down the list for the magistrate. Boom. Magistrate orders Wiggles to be confined in the brig through her trial. First Sergeant Bob and Platoon Sergeant Maggie go to pick her up from her on-base housing. She won't open the door, but they know she's inside because they can clearly hear her and Mr. Wiggles banging away. This is important for later. The Wiggles finish up. She takes her time getting showered and dressed and finally comes to the door when it pleases her. Off she goes to the brig. The pre-trial process takes up the next four weeks. During that time, I have to deal with Captain Morgan, the paralegals in his office, and various fun things to do with her pending court martial. Other than that, it's blissfully peaceful. Wiggles chills in the brig for four weeks. Seriously, chills. Every time I had a visit, it was freezing in there. I'm required to make weekly welfare visits to see if she's being mistreated, if she has any needs that aren't being met, etc. It seems weird, but as her commander, I'm still responsible to make sure the brig staff aren't mistreating my soldier. Other going ons in this time period include Mr. Wiggles fraudulently applies for a car loan and gets a van in their names. Mr. Wiggles is dishonorably discharged and kicked off the island, flies home to wherever he originally enlisted from. Captain Morgan asks me to consider an other than honorable discharge and time served in lieu of taking things all the way to trial. I'm hot to get that pound of flesh from her, but my legal counsel advises me to avoid the court martial and just kick out Wiggles with the other than honorable discharge. After all, he says she's already been locked up for almost three weeks, so the magistrate will probably just give her time served and the other than honorable anyway. See my earlier comment about sound legal advice. My boss, Lieutenant Colonel Ryan, thinks I'm too invested in the case, that I'm no longer objective. Lieutenant Ryan insists on coming with me to the brig for the next welfare visit. This is three weeks into Wiggles' stay in those luxurious accommodations. Among other nonsense lines she throws at us, Wiggles tells us that she needs to see the dentist about a filling that's giving her trouble, and Motrin just isn't working. At the end of the visit, Lieutenant Colonel Ryan tells the guards about Wiggles' filling, asks if they can give her anything stronger than Motrin, then instructs them to follow up with the dentist. The guard actually laughs out loud at this and says, no sir, Motrin is the best thing we can do in the brig. And the other thing, for the last two weeks, she's been telling anyone with ears that she wants to try getting her wisdom teeth pulled before she's kicked out. She doesn't have a problem with any fillings. It was hilarious to watch Lieutenant Colonel Ryan's face go from obvious concern for Wiggles' well-being to outright fury. And the next words out of his mouth were, that be lied to me. I make arrangements with Captain Morgan to accept his request for time served with an other than honorable in lieu of court martial. Sometime later that week, I get a call from the brig. Wiggles is pregnant. Remember that scene in her house four weeks prior? And they can't keep her confined anymore because of it. She has to be released back to her unit until the court martial or other actions are complete. Captain Morgan stakes his reputation on Wiggles being a good girl until we can send her back home to Carolina. He'll come to regret that and he can't say that I didn't warn him. We get Wiggles back from her four weeks all-inclusive stay in the brig. I've accepted Captain Morgan's request to avoid the court martial and I confine Wiggles to the barracks under supervision for the nine days she has left until her flight to Carolina. Immediately, we have another mess on our hands. Wiggles is smoking in the barracks. Not a big deal that she's smoking, it's just not allowed inside barracks 
barrack rooms. Wiggles is caught with a bottle of hypnotic, a liquor, in the barrack rooms. She's still only 19. Wiggles slips out of the barracks and runs off for a day when her platoon sergeant gets distracted from supervising her. First Sergeant Bob and Lieutenant Ricky, the executive officer, go to collect Wiggles' belongings from her base housing so we can box it up and ship it to her home. And they find out that Mr. Wiggles has left behind a bunch of stuff he stole from other soldiers. Body armor, military equipment, some ammunition, smoke grenades, and explosives that he stole during trips to the range. All lined up right inside the front door where it's impossible to miss. They call me asking what to do. I say, just collect it all. Return the equipment to the central issue facility and dump the ammo and explosives in the nearest amnesty box. Mr. Wiggles obviously meant for Wiggles to take the fall for having it. Husband of the year. If we take that bait, Wiggles will be here forever. I don't want that. Do you? Lieutenant Ricky says, nope, I don't want that either. It'll be like it never happened. In light of all this drama, I bring Wiggles into my office to remind her of her agreement to be a good girl until she leaves the island. With Lieutenant Ricky as a witness in the office to protect my butt, I say, Wiggles, you're in violation of your release agreement from the brig. You've been sneaking out of the barracks. You've been smoking, drinking. Wiggles cuts me off and says, yeah, I'm doing all kinds of drugs too. She said with a heavily sarcastic voice. I tell her, be that as it may, I'm giving you fair warning that you're at risk of losing the deal I made with Captain Morgan. Additionally, you're pregnant again. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but most of the damage to a fetus from alcohol and smoking will come in the first few weeks after conception. I don't know if you're planning to keep this one or not, but at the rate you're going, this baby's going to be born dumber than you. Wiggles is speechless, gaping like a fish, and finally picks her jaw up off the floor. Wiggles then bolts out of my office and runs down to Lieutenant Colonel Ryan's office at the other end of the building to squeal on me for insulting her. Lieutenant Ricky is hot on her heels. She tries to rush into Lieutenant Colonel Ryan's office, but Lieutenant Ricky gets in first and fills him in. Lieutenant Ricky tells me later how it went down. Wiggles is yelling about how I called her stupid, a strangely vanilla thing for her to focus on, considering everything she's done, but you do you, and that she's being mistreated. Lieutenant Colonel Ryan yells at his administrator to get Captain Morgan on the phone now. He reams Captain Morgan for his client's foolishness and tells him to fix this now and makes various threats to Captain Morgan's career. About a half an hour later, I get a call from Captain Morgan. Captain Morgan says, Baka, baka, baka. Yes, he did that whole patronizing thing. I can't believe the words I'm hearing from Wiggles. I'm shocked. I'm just shocked that you would use language like that and call her names. Side note, my mom is an attorney and I grew up with tales from the courthouse about lawyers using this exact sort of hyperbole. Your Honor, I am shocked. I am appalled and dismayed that the opposing counsel would attempt to paint my client in such a light. It's the kind of nonsense they said when they didn't have a good argument. So as soon as I hear the word shocked, I know I own him and immediately cut in. I say, and I bet you're appalled and dismayed too. Captain Morgan, stumbling and sounding slightly confused, says, Well, yes, of course I am. You can't talk to soldiers like that. I know of a lieutenant colonel, a commander, who called one of her soldiers stupid and she's no longer in command now. I didn't call her stupid. I informed her of basic biological facts. Not my problem if she takes the news poorly. And arguably, she's not all that smart. Anyway, you called me and I'm pretty sure it isn't to warn me about what I said to Wiggles. So what do you want? What will it take you to prevent you from kicking back our deal? Apparently, Lieutenant Colonel Ryan had cinched his butt up good and tight. You could get her on a plane tomorrow. How about if I get her out of here by Friday? It was Wednesday at the time and she was due to fly out the following Wednesday. I don't think you can manage that, but good on you if you do. To his credit, Captain Morgan gets Wiggles a flight for Sunday, three days early. I print up official orders appointing Lieutenant Ricky as a military escort specifically for her. Lieutenant Ricky drives her to the airport and the airline desk agent calls me to verify his status when they get to the checking counter. They give him a special pass to get through security with her. He stays with her at the gate to make sure she gets on and stays on the plane, then stays at the gate until the plane is in the air. Some boogers are hard to flick. We wanted to make sure this one landed someplace else. About a month later, I get a call from the military police police about a derelict van in the parking lot with all four tires slashed. Guess who it belonged to. It's really kind of sad when I look back on it. I had two other soldiers come to me at different points asking to get out of the army ahead of their contracts. One just didn't want to be in the army anymore. The other did want to stay in the army but had family issues that would be a lot easier to deal with as a civilian. They played by the rules and I got both of them out with honorable discharges and all the benefits. They even qualified for unemployment. 
Too easy. Wiggles could have had the same treatment. I told her exactly what I could do for her, then had to shift gears and told her what I was going to do to her. Then I did it. I could have been her best friend on the way out the door, but instead I ended up owning her and her dumb defense attorney. She ruined her chances of transition benefits and access to the VA and picked up a lifelong black mark for employment, all because she couldn't play nice for a few weeks. She decided she wanted to play mess around games and we all know what happened next. So am I the jerk for how I handled this? There is a lot more leeway that they gave to her than I would have expected in this sort of military environment. It was almost like the equivalent of putting a kid in a timeout, but the kid keeps breaking out and you can't keep giving them punishments because the punishments don't mean anything to the kid. It was actually a good point somebody brought up in the responses saying, I bet there's a long history of illegal substance abuse and toxic relationships at play here. She's 19 years old, wrecked with untreated STDs, stripping, bruised up, framed for crime by her husband, multiple unwanted pregnancies, etc. It kind of makes me wonder if her hubby is her pimp. That's exactly what it seems like. It seems like she's already gone through a lot of this and she's acting more in a reactionary way than anything to the set of circumstances that may have been imposed on her from earlier in life, but also definitely from her husband. Just the fact that he was trying to set her up to get caught by putting all of those stolen things right in plain sight when they came in says a lot about the relationship. Like he was trying to punish her here too. The OP actually responded to this and said, this bothered me at the time and does to this day. I was genuinely confused by her response to my straightforward offer to get her out of the army. Easy peasy, no harm, no foul. I left a lot of detail out for the sake of brevity, but I really did try to help her understand that I would do right by her. She just couldn't slash wouldn't accept it. And I was left with no other options. Military culture is vastly different than civilian culture. Action and response timelines are dramatically shortened. We just don't have time to deal with personal issues in a caring, coaching, mentoring way, especially if the owner of those personal issues is not willing or able to be an active participant in their resolution. It makes for a good revenge story, but it wasn't my preferred outcome. If I had my druthers, I'd have sent her home amicably. I'll note here that she did not go to the same location that her husband went to when he was discharged. So let me know how you see the situation down below. How do you think you would have handled it and jerk or not a jerk and why? When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. To finish listening to all the stories in this series, use the playlist at the top of the description. And next time you live stream, use the cream of the crop music. Search for cream of the stream on Spotify or whatever music platform you use for copyright free music to use for your stream. It's free cream of the stream. Either way, thanks a lot for listening. I'll see you guys next time.